Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the final panel of British Beauty Week. And I'd like to introduce you to my wonderful panel today. I'm Jane Sterland, um, and I'm representing the Sustainable Beauty Coalition as part of the British Beauty Council. And I have joining with me today three amazing people, Scott Winsett, Joanne Cook, and Lauren Murrell. And we'll hear a little bit more from them in a moment. So first of all, congratulations for making it to the end of British Beauty Week. And um, congratulations for joining us on a Sunday afternoon at five o'clock. We are going to talk about the courage to change and the topic of how sustainable is beauty today and how sustainable can beauty become. And it's particularly relevant today in the light of um, the IPCC report, which came out a couple of weeks ago, that uh, really starkly tells us that we globally have to do something about the climate emergency and the fact that we really only have another five years of, of, of carbon left in terms of the emissions. And we, as a beauty industry, really do have to start taking it very seriously and to become much more activist in the way we approach sustainability. And we're gonna talk lots more about that. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to my wonderful guest today. And I'm gonna start with you, Jo. Um, Joanne Cook, Holland and Barrett, tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, anything that you'd like to share. So my name is Jo Cook, I'm the Trading Director at Holland and Barrett um, and on a personal level I've got a massive passion for sustainability. Um, so I, I've been on a zero waste journey for, for a number of years now as my husband every time he thinks about buying a plastic bottle, I'm like you drink the tap water, um, we'll, 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 ask, we'll ask Jane too. Um, and really, um, from, a, from, a, from an environmental point of view, the journey that I've been on, I've, I've learned how many easy swaps there are, how many small things that we can, we can all do. And actually, added together, those small things start to make a really big difference. And from a pro professional point of view at Holland and Barrett, um, we've, we've, we've been on a similar journey. So 18 months ago, we highlighted um, the uh, beauty, beauty wipes um, as an issue, kind of single-use single wipes. Um, and, and actually that drove a lot of awareness of the kind of swaps you can make in, in your beauty routine. And then more recently, uh, we've been talking to customers about sheet masks. So single use, throw in the bin, and the, there are options. So, so I think from a, from a personal level, I'm, I'm really lucky to be working for a fantastic company that really support, supports sustainability. And, and I feel real, a real responsibility to kind of to use my role um, to really help everybody in in the UK understand what easy swaps they can make and, and what what difference that they that they can make. Thank you. And I've just noticed that in the chat um, that our wonderful team behind the scenes are putting lots and lots of references for for you to have a look at. So um, I can see, Joe, like it or not, your LinkedIn profile has gone up there, as has mine. <laughs> Um, and the Courage to Change report is also put there, and I will talk a little bit more about the Courage to Change report in a moment. So I'm going to hand over to the wonderful Scott Wimsett. Tell us about yourself, Scott, and what gets you goat? Oh, all sorts of things. Hello, everybody. Happy Sunday and happy last day of British Beauty Week. I mean, well done to the British Beauty Council. Uh, big girl crush on Millie, love you dearly and all of the hard work you're doing in Diana and everybody behind the scenes. How exciting that we're at this stage in the industry where we can have these conversations that have been, you know, slightly neglected and um, we, a, a few of us have been wanting to have them for such a long time and to Jane particularly um, mm -hmm. for ste steering the uh, Sustainable Beauty Coalition, I'm thrilled to be a part of it. Um, so my name's Scott Wimsett. Um, I've got a company called Bespoke Banter uh, that was started 20 years ago to build content for fashion and beauty brands. So all of that kind of, you know, anything from three seconds to three minutes. Um, so the Instagram fodder, uh, a lot of the work that we did was with talent and sort of ambassador work and launches of product. And about five years ago, I started to feel very much that there was a responsibility with the volume of content that we were putting out for all of those big brands, be it Coty, be it Estee Lauder, be it P&G, be it, you know, L'Oreal, et cetera, et cetera. 
Um, and just some of the language that was coming back into emails um, I had an issue with. So my sustainability journey actually started much more from a kind of, um, uh, you know, uh, DNI perspective. Uh, when they were asking, like, can the skin be made lighter or, you know, from a female empowerment perspective, then they were talking about can her legs be thinner, you know, all of this sort of stuff, which I had an issue with. So we started something called the Feel Good Fellowship, which has obviously over the last couple of years really taken a, a, a very strong narrative and, and in way of actually going into brands and like navigating their uh, ethical storytelling. And I started that with a girlfriend of mine called Arizona Muse who is an activist and a model and, um, you know, is a bit of a nerd when it comes to sustainability. Um, and we are going into brands and making sure the right people are in the room, which I'll talk about later. Um, but yeah, I, ultimately I'm a content creator and a planet positive presenter. Um, and I'm thrilled to be here today with keeping such good company. Wow, planet positive presenter. Great title, Scott. I made that one up. <laughs> Hopefully today we're all planet positive presenters. Uh, and then finally, I'd like to introduce Lauren Murrell. Over to you, Lauren. Tell us about yourself. Thank you, Jane. And it's a real pleasure to be here. Picking up on the theme of personal sustainability journeys, I've had two particularly momentous moments on my journey that have sort of brought me to this moment today. Um, the first of which was recovering from a really aggressive form of leukemia, um, where my sister Sarah started making skincare at home for me at the kitchen table to help restore and nourish my very sensitive, very irritated skin. And she took a very intentional, very mindful approach to the skincare formulations that she started to develop. And she started to use plant oils and really helped me and educated me in understanding that skincare is so much more than just the product that you pick up the shelf. How about if we take a different perspective and look at each individual ingredient and see how that really helps the skin. Um, fast forward many years later um, and the skincare blends that my sister developed at the kitchen table have developed into the skincare that we have today by Sarah London and we're able to help so many more people beyond those that have gone through that cancer journey but also those that are really interested in exactly what is in their skincare and that's a huge piece of the sustainability puzzle really understanding what is in those products where have they come from what is their sustainability journey if you like and the second part of my journey has been coming face to face with climate change I was living in the Caribbean in the British Virgin Islands four years ago when Hurricane Irma made landfall. It was a category five hurricane, one of the strongest hurricanes ever recorded. Um, and I was there. I was in a house where the windows were ripped off, the doors were ripped off, and I absolutely feared for my life. It was a terrifying experience and really, really brought home how serious climate change is. And it's something we're very passionate about now by Sarah London and really understanding sustainability because my goodness, I've seen it and it is, it's scary. Thank you guys. Thank you for giving up your Sunday afternoons um, and joining us for this really important topic. Um, and thank you everybody for coming. Uh, really encourage you to use the Q&A, send us your questions, use the chat, share any links, because we're only going to be able to, to tackle the big problem that we have, um, both facing the climate emergency and what the beauty industry response is if we actually work together. We share what we know, we share best practice, and we're as transparent and honest as we possibly can be. And Scott, when we were in the, the green room, shall I call it, um, we were talking about our tone of voice and, you know, um, what, what, what should we be saying? And you said very clearly, we need to be much more activist. So first question, and, it, and it's to all the panelists, but I'm going to start with you, Scott. How, where is beauty in terms of sustainability and how can our future of beauty become more sustainable? Yeah, 
It's a very good question. And, and, you know, it chimes back into the header of this, which is the courage to change. I think, you know, having spent the last few months where we've really been, you know, far more in front of brands with regards to Feel Good Fellowship and what we're trying to achieve, it's been fascinating to see how some brands are very aware of the Titanic needing to turn around and exactly what they need to do in regards to skill set in-house. Um, and others that are, you know, head in sand and trying to pretend that this actually isn't happening. Um, the industry as a whole, I firmly believe, has to go back to really analysing carefully about what it looks like now and not trying to shoehorn or greenwash or piggyback or copycat or, you know, it's this unbelievably definitive time in history where there's a line in the sand and best practice, you know, embracing circular economy, uh, you know, sharing our knowledge is, as you say, the only way forward. Now, it's a very scary time. And I think that's that word, the courage to change. It's, it's, it's like, what does, what does courage really stand for? You know, when I've been asking people and I've spoken to my husband about it as well, it's all about the sense of um, really needing to move through fear. And the only reason that we have fear is because we don't have information. I know in my life, you know, whenever I've sort of found that real fear sort of element come in is when I'm in a situation where I actually am having to wing it and I don't really know what I'm talking about. And the, the fear can be crippling to the fact, fact that I can't actually perform uh, in, in business or in, in actual performance or, or whatever. And it's, it's the time now is actually to get ourselves from fear into safety. And the safe place is actually dealing with clarity. And that means that the industry as a whole, which, you know, it's lots of things and it's amazing. And, I, you know, we're all plugged into it for many, many different reasons, but it has got a um, modern day narrative that is a bit flippant. It's a bit indulgent. It's, it's, it's bases many, many products on the back of talent um, that, you know, you don't really need to scratch the surface too much because it's all actually quite pleasant on your social feed and it's an entertainment channel, it's a distraction. And actually what we're talking about is all of us being that activist, every single one of us in our jobs, in our day-to-day -day life, in our relationships, in our role model to our children, we have a legacy to leave. And this is, you know, brings us back to the conversation around just how dire is the situation? How dramatic is it? You know, Joe Biden's sort of calling it, you know, this is an existential climate crisis. We are at war with our planet, our beautiful planet, and we're at war with it, you know, and it's, it's very um, emotional from a kind of activist perspective. And I think well, as we kind of navigate through this, we get to know different activists on our journey and you go, oh, you're at that stage. And I've just moved out of the angry stage, you know, where you're kind of this despair. I'm trying to go now to the solutions because the conversation has got so exciting. And so it feels that people are listening. Um, I guess the industry, there's gonna be some casualties and there's gonna be some big ones. You know, I think it's um, an unbelievably fascinating territory, both fashion and beauty, two industries that carry many, many sins. Um, you know, it's something like 120 billion units of packaging from the beauty industry annually. You know, it's, it's a huge, problematic contributor to the climate and environmental issues that we're dealing with globally. Um, so my biggest concern is how can they become the, the sprinters in this marathon? You know, we've got this new decade. I'm sort of reiterating what people are telling me when I'm sort of surrounding myself with people who really know what they're talking about far more than what I do, but I'm trying to be a sort of sounding board or, or, or a voice for them. You know, this is the make or break decade, as you said. You know, 2030 is the new 2050. You know, we need to see so much happen pretty much in the next 
you know, really significant change in the next two years to the beauty industry to be able to have the results by the end of the decade that we need to keep us safe. Because if we don't, the domino effect is, you know, catastrophic in regards to what will happen environmentally. And so that kind of, that kind of um, despair also is caught with that kind of sense of hope and, and that fight as well, because it's too big a situation to ignore. There's so many situations in our lives historically that you can park and this we just can't. Um, I've got a child, I'm adopting another child, you know, this, this sort of thing, like a world that we're leaving to these children, you know, it's so, so important that we protect it. So to close, I would say, from my perspective, sustainability is a word that's been bastardized. It's also got zero regulation. It's, um, you know, very, very uh, a free for all. Um, thank goodness for yourself and the Sustainable Beauty Coalition that can start to gather up from a UK perspective, our joint um, values and our joint targets and, you know, sort of align us all in an open source way and getting the right people in the room, which I'll talk about later, but it is different. You know, we, we've got to look at our boardroom and go, this is the usual cast, so let's change it. So I just noticed that in the chat, thank you, Will, you just posted some really great stats um, that, um, that I think we, we, we might know about, but are we really that aware? Scott, you mentioned them as well, you know, in terms of the, um, the 120 billion units of plastic um, from the beauty industry every year in single use. So, Joe, that's something that you feel very passionately about at Holland and Barrett, don't you? What, what, what steps are you taking at Holland and Barrett um, in relation to sustainability as one of the major retailers of, of beauty? in the UK, but also as a responsible retailer. I think I might just go back to the question that you, you asked Scott first, which was how, how do you think we're doing as an, as an industry? Um, and I think if we're honest, if, if, I, if I look at kind of all the brands and all the retailers, there's a few shining lights who are doing a brilliant job. So, you know, um, Brown West from Atique, amazing job. Joe Chibley at Beauty Kitchen, Walida also doing great faith in nature. And then you can go right down the spectrum and then you get to a bunch of people who are pretending to be sustainable to sell a few more things but are, haven't really got the credentials to back it up right down to people who really aren't aren't taking any notice whatsoever so so really i feel where we where we need to move in the next few years is to bring really bring people a lot further up that curve so that it, it, it's important for everybody and that, and that everybody is doing kind of kind of a, a best in class job and I think from, a, from an industry perspective, I think we've got a few jobs to do. So I think we need to make it easier for, for customers to, to make the, the right, right choices. And the story, I'll share the story that I shared with you, Jane, um, about my gin and tonic. So, so obviously um, I'm, I'm really into this kind of stuff. I, I speak to a lot of sustainability experts through the brands that we deal with. And I, and I was speaking with one of them, I kind of said, you know, I like, I like a gin and tonic on a Friday night. Should I be buying the, the tonic in the glass bottle, which I can pay to the bottle bank and recycle, or should I be buying the tonic in the little aluminium can? Because I can, I can see positives for both of them. And, and even me, who's someone who is really into this and you know deals with this a lot on a day to day, I didn't know the answer. And actually, that, that, that's a specific to the sustainability expert of the aluminium can. But then I spoke to somebody else who said the glass bottle the next week. So, so I think it's confusing for everyone. And if it's confusing for people who are really into it, and a lot of a lot of time kind of you know talking to experts then then for, for the average consumer you know it, it, it's an absolute minefield so i think as a british beauty council we've got a real job to do to 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 really help customers make the right decisions help them understand what easy swaps they can make you know and 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 and, and understand you know product a versus product b from a sustainability point of view i think the other thing um i think the other thing that we we need to focus on is single use so anything, anything that you use once and chuck in the bin that's not compostable um, is not great. Um, so so at, the, at, at the moment, there's, there's a lot of things. So at Holland and Barrett, we, we, we highlighted um, wet wipes as one of those things. You know, use, use a flannel. Use, use one of those little cotton pads that you can put in the wash. You know, it's, it's a dead easy swap. Um, also more recently been highlighting sheet masks. Again, just, you know, use a mask that you wipe off. There's, there's no need really for which is effectively a wipe on your face. Um, 
and, and, and throw in the bin. And I think the other one that's that's probably more tricky at the moment is one of the ways that we can we can kind of consume less is if we is if we buy the right beauty products first time. So we'll have all been in that scenario whereby you're looking for the perfect moisturizer or the perfect lipstick, and you've probably bought a few to get there. Um, and actually, if you manage to get the, the right one the first time, then that's, those couple of useless purchases don't happen. The tricky that we've got now with COVID is historically people used to have testers, but I don't know about anyone else, but I would not want to put my hands in a tester right now. Um, and I'm not sure that customers will get to the point where they, you know, they're happy to put their finger in a spot that lots of other people put their finger in. It just doesn't feel great. Um, the other option for that at the moment is sachets, but you know, they're single use. You know, they're not recyclable at the moment. There isn't a recyclable option for sachets. So, so I think I think kind of really trying to push the industry to 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 come up with a really innovative way to help customers get to the right product first time without the kind of single use or COVID issues that that that, that we've that we've that, that we've got at the moment. And I think the third thing is as a retailer, I think all retailers have got a real job to do to hold their brands to account. So ultimately my team decide what goes in goes on the shelves in, in our shop. Um, and we, we can kind of speak to suppliers and, and we, we have a, a kind of buying ethos. We have a kind of list of, if, if, if you do any of these things, we just won't stop you. If, you, if, you, if your farm oil isn't sustainable, if, um, and we're, we're looking at kind of packaging and, and all, all sorts of other things. If you contain a whole load of chemicals that we don't feel are great for the environment, we won't put you on the shelves. And, and I think really part of making it easy for customers to, to, to make better decisions is for retailers to, to, to only really stock the better, the better products. Um, and there's, you know, there's all sorts of things as a, as, a, as a consumer you can do. I'm a massive convert to shampoo bars. Um, can't talk highly enough about shampoo bars. Compostable packaging, just cardboard, you don't want compost heat. And um, none of the plastic bottles. And there's so many, so many other easy swaps we could we, we could all be making. We've just got to help people, help people understand. Thank you. Over to you, Lauren. And I'm particularly interested in in how you answer this, um, being a, a small um, but very strong contender, but a, a small company because you don't have the resources of of larger businesses. So, yeah, first of all, question is how can beauty become more sustainable? But specifically, how can small beauty brands become more sustainable when you don't have the resources at your fingertips? Yeah, I, I think the sort of elephant in the room that we haven't sort of touched on yet is the most sustainable thing we could possibly do is not make anything anymore. <laughs> Just stop making things. You know, there's so much that's already been created. So I think as a small business owner, the most, the kindest thing we can do when we are creating something new is how can we be as true to ourselves? Because anything that we create going forward, or anything that we buy now, is not helpful to the planet. So you've got to have a really good reason for making it or buying it. Um, and the view we take at, by Sarah London is to be as transparent as we possibly can so that the customers can be as informed as possible in making their choices. So to Joanne's point, you know what you're buying from us, what's in there, what if you've got certain allergies, perhaps you know that's not for you. Or if you're really looking for a certain ingredient, you can identify that quicker and hopefully get that match. But what we've done is really bring a lot of radical transparency to our collection. So we've got a full ingredient list on the front label. Now, many legacy brands wouldn't dream of doing anything like that because there's lots of ingredients they might not want us to know about. Um, but with this radical transparency, the consumer can see exactly what's inside. So we've got organic almond oil, organic apricot seed oil, and also really innovative upcycled ingredients. So we use upcycled hemp seed, which is grown here in the UK. And the seeds are saved from landfill. So they're diverted from going to waste. And those seeds concentrate over time and the antioxidant value actually goes up. So the hemp seeds we use in our blemish recovery oil has 52% more antioxidants than its standard counterpart. So it's much better for your skin and it's much better for the planet as well. So 
I think as a brand, it's just trying to find the best possible ingredients that we can. So really baking sustainability into every single drop that's in the product and making that transparency really clear for the customer. Um, so as well as the front labeling, our vegan products are certified with the Vegan Society and our products are certified with Cruelty Free International as well. So as a consumer, you know, it can be extremely overwhelming. What sustainability choices should I be making? Should it be water-free beauty or should it be avoiding plastic? Or there's so many different uh, channels and options that you can take and it's our duty as a brand to make that transparency of information as open as possible so the consumer can make a choice that you know really sits with their values and I think with sustainability being such um, a, an a messy and amorphous concept that no one has a singular definition for it's really tapping into what are your values as a consumer what are you looking for and then trying to match that with the brands that you want to support. And I think that does give you a level of empowerment in a space that can feel just completely overwhelming otherwise. I think it's very interesting when you talk about transparency um, and self-regulation. And you've, you've mentioned about um, the legacy brands and you're, you're putting your inky code right on the, on the front. I, I guess I would pose the question, can we... Do, do you think we're we're grown up enough to self-regulate? Do you think we can have that level of transparency right across the industry? And what do you think the barriers might be? I would love to see that. Uh, I think as a young brand, as an indie brand, you know, we can be pioneers in that way and say this is a way that works. Um, and our customers love that. They love that they understand what's inside each bottle. So you get the rewards from the customers loving it. And hopefully that sets an example that this degree of, of transparency is so empowering um, and is definitely one way forward. And, and Joe, you see so many brands every day in your role. Um, do you trust, do you trust the brands you see? Do you trust us when we come to pitch to you? We say that, you know, we're, we're sustainable, whatever that means. We're organic, whatever that means. Um, what, what, what do you do to really kind of push us to go behind the label and, and to, to be more responsible in what we say? Yeah, so we, we ask a lot of questions and we ask for a lot of certification um, for everything that we stock, but not all, not all retailers do. Um, certainly from a personal point of view, when I, when I have a salesperson come to me and talks to me about how passionate they are about sustainability, I, I ask them what they do at home. Um, and, and some of them can't really give, they're like, um, have we used plastic bags? And I'm like, hmm, you're, this, is, this is a sales pitch for you. You're, you're not really into this. Um, so, so I think, you know, as, as, as retailers, we've got a real job to do to, to, to check that what people are saying, saying is right. And obviously, from your point of view, Jane, we, we know we know that the great job that we're leader we leader are doing, but certainly we we would welcome industry regulation. Um, I'd be really keen on a personal point of view to see labelling on the front of packaging. So in the same way that the food industry, you know, you go and buy something from 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 the supermarket and it tells you how much fat, salt, sugar is, you know, how many calories are in are in the thing that you're buying. I think we need that level of labelling, you know, that level of carbon labelling across the industry for for people really to be able to to make to make um kind of make make the, the right choices um, we would definitely definitely welcome that um, if, if you look at kind of other industries um, I, th I think self-regulation is as is, is, is proven to be tricky so again that the food industry um, we've obviously had lots of um, lots of focus on on the obesity ep epidemic over the past few years and, and, and that industry, you know, the, those food industries have been encouraged to self-regulate. And actually, we, we are moving quite quickly over the next 12 months to, to, to quite heavy regulation, which I, which, which I think is the right thing to do. Um, but I think the British Beauty Council um, and the Sustainability Coalition um, can play a really strong role um, in pushing that forward with government um, and in encouraging regulation and encouraging industry standards. Um, and I think also, you know, retailers, early adoption of any standards, I think is, I think is really key. 
I think the Competition and Markets Authority um, are going to be producing some of their initial guidelines next week, um, specifically aimed at claims from the beauty industry. So I think that's a really good start. And it would be really great to see much stronger regulation coming in. I mean, particularly for, from me working with Walida, where we've been um, organic and about 80% of all of our ingredients are certified organic or biodynamic. You know, we've been doing it for 100 years. And when you can have an organic, a, a, a beauty brand saying they're organic with less than 1% of organic ingredients, um, it's absolutely not a level playing field. So I really welcome um, I, I, I do think we need a lot of intervention. And, you know, Scott, um, in Beautiful Banter, you, you know, you, you talk about being, um, a, a, a talking about positivity. You know, I, I know that that's something that you've been doing a lot of work over over the last couple of years. And you, you, that's how you introduce yourself. But how do you hold brands account to account with what they want to say in, in their greenwashed marketing blurb? Yeah, it's the green sheen, isn't it? You know, I think the, um, you know, the, the sort of business model for many, many years worked. You know, we, we, we knew that actually, in all honesty, and, and, and I'm talking about the, the bigger brands, you know, I know it's a lot of the same stuff just in different parts with a different talent on the front of that campaign. <laughs> Um, and, you know, we didn't ask the question that there was just a huge check with lots and lots of zeros that 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 talent would have never seen that product before. And suddenly, because they had a movie that was successful or a, a, a music track that was successful, you know, that was how to sell product. Um, and it's just all different now. So our work at Feel Good Fellowship is what does it mean to feel good? And feel good is, is generally like in life when you're actually telling the truth, because there's a freedom to it. You know, having your hands tied in that way of greenwashing and sort of having a very small percentage of your business that you can talk about, that is going to trip you up, especially with the curiosity that we have from our citizens now, and especially from our new gen. There, we do a lot of castings and, you know, when we're putting content together for brands and, you know, if we're bringing in that young voice and I'm talking from 18 to 25, there is a zero tolerance because they know it's on their watch that they have to, you know, do everything they can to protect this planet. So if you're trying to future proof your business, then it's the education piece. But it's not coming from, and I'm talking about the word positivity and I do want, I don't want to sound waggy finger and telling people off because you know that we're, we're all in this together none of it that you know not many people set out to be devils in the industry it's just it's happened that way and actually by the way you could earn an awful lot of money you know <laughs> some of these brands um you know have, have done very very well um and all of that money went made went into the marketing to then allure you to buy more product and so the principles you know as lauren was saying have, have completely changed we have to be our own activists when we're going around the beauty halls and the when you're shopping online and you're you're at the supermarket you know you have to start really looking at these packages and and all of the wording and all of the ingredients and then go on to their social sites which is what we're doing to make sure that that click play reward isn't just a nice sort of heavily airbrushed image of someone you know looking fabulous having their best life it's like how transparent can that brand be? Can they bring you in and talk about all the unsexy stuff as well as, you know, the sexy stuff like materials and labor and, you know, what everyone's ringing on about, but some of the much more, you know, the data, this sort of stuff from a supply chain perspective that can be a bit dry, but actually we need to, in, con, you know, consider that that's new age luxury. New age luxury now is actually meeting a brand that you can have that broadsheet slightly more grown up conversation with. And that's fine because that's where we're at. The world changes. And so, you know, beauty suddenly got more serious. Brilliant. Um, so, I mean, I guess to me, it's, it's making these bite-sized assets from a, um, a filming perspective, doing like, you know, doc, short docu content for brands that speak about every arm of what sustainability stands for. Um, and putting that across the industry rather than some people talking about a tiny part of that. Um, and that I think will go a great way, you know, that we, we almost could possibly divide our social channels into having one that is much more edutainment 
um, you know, that's, you know, sorry, one that's much more entertainment and, and, and really fun to watch and can have a sense of humour and all of that. And then the other one can just be much more informative where you go to to do your due diligence, to know that you are in the driving seat of your purchasing decisions and you've done your homework and therefore your money is your power and you're backing those brands that reflect your values. Um, yeah. Yeah, that, that's a great, great phrase, backing, backing the brands that align to your values. One of the things that I'm fascinated about, and I very often say when somebody says to me, you know, what, what brand should I look at is, well, go behind the label. What's the purpose of the business? Who is behind the label? Is, are, are they there to maximize shareholder value? Um, you know, is, is their business a business to be business in terms of making money or are they the, there because they're on a mission they have a very strong purpose like you, you've articulated Lauren um, so Scott you mentioned earlier about you know who's in the boardroom so talk to us about who who do you see in the boardroom and how do you think that needs to change it's um it's suddenly got really exciting in the boardroom or wherever we're doing it on a zoom or you know sitting at someone's home or you know whatever it is it's 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 about realizing that you can't do it all on your own and bringing in the scientists the science is very clear you know we can see very clearly what we have to do that when we are making these decisions where we've moved somebody from a pr department into sustainability where they're wildly out of their depth um, that's not future-proofing your business. What's future-proofing your business is the conversations that we're all having and Lauren and Joanne and, and yourself, where we're saying, you know, get the engineers in, get the activists in, get the policy makers in, get the environmentalists in. They're the people that actually should be talking to us about how we redefine the product, how that whole journey from concept to how that citizen receives that product is as, as uh, planet positive as it possibly can be. You know, they are the ones that hold the key to the solutions. And it's, we need everything. We need super fast solutions. So this sort of mentality of like closed door, this is our brand, that's, you, you, you know, you're, you're literally sinking with that mentality. You're a heavy dead weight. It's about opening our arms, as I do in my kimono there, which helps with my, fabric flowing but to open our arms and just be like holding hands as an industry and saying like you've said open source sharing this knowledge I mean I'm using one example of a brand that we've worked with recently and L'Occitane you know are very much like we're leader in the way of that heritage and have those credentials to share you know best in practice things that have worked and things that haven't I go back to the word speed we just simply do not have the time step by step it would have been great 45 years ago, but it's not 45 years ago, it's now. And we need to see dramatic change in the next few months uh, and in the next couple of years. So it really is getting the right people in the room, making them a key decision maker in how your brand moves forward. Um, and I mean, I, I think Lauren's really accurate as well. We need to think about, um, you know, the scale of your business because the infrastructure of a very, very large business, of course, carries all of those very complicated challenges. Um, and I don't know the necessary answers to that. I've got a few ideas, but you know, it, I, I think that that's another massive thing. I think business needs to look about not being just the bottom line and profit. You know, it's how can we collectively solve this? Because that's exciting. This sort of united forces and industry that we became a massive contributor to the, the, the solution. Like how amazing is that? But it's, I know it's very complex. So yeah, they're my thoughts. Thank you. It, it is very complex, but also it, it's very simple as well. And I think the complexity comes in with, with scale. Um, and I think that it, it, you know, if you're a Unilever or a P&G, then, the, and they, they're doing some amazing work, L'Oreal too, in terms of transitioning, but it will take it will take years. Um, I mean, I, I know just from Walida's point of view, and we're about half a billion euro turnover, that you know we're looking at transitioning um, on our plastics, but it will take us two or three years to, to, to get there. Um, one of the things we did talk about earlier, it was been mentioned about shampoo bars, about uh, waterless beauty. 
Um, and Lauren, you, you also mentioned about the amount of water we use. So at Walida, one of the things that really shocked us was we've just done a really big carbon audit and over 50% of the, the carbon that um, is, um, is released during the making and, and creation of the product actually rests with the consumer. So that means getting it to the consumer and the way they use it. But where in the Western world, we're using 145 on average liters of water per day with all of our bathing and showering and so on. And water is such a precious resource. You know, that is something we, we need to really look at. So what I'm interested in talking about now is how can we impact on on the types of products we make and the type of product or the, the routines and rituals you you use our products so for example if you go back to look at old-fashioned soap um and i spoke to um a millennial the other day who um was talking about you know shower bars and i said is that a soap and they looked at me gone out it's like no that's not soap but I think it is really I think it's just soap by another name um but that's fine but you know when you when you look at that very simple packaging you know it lasts much much longer than than say shower gels um which contribute to the 120 billion single pieces of plastic that the beauty industry is creating every year so so lauren from from your brand perspective how can we really change consumer behavior so that we don't think that um, we, we have to have lots of baths and showers every day. And, and mm -hmm. just before I hand over to you, um, I smiled this week when I saw a newspaper headline that said, you know, now the hippies and the crusties are telling us we shouldn't wash so much. How, how, do, how do we tackle that? I think there's a couple of ways you can go about it. I think where we would come to it is bringing this idea of intention and mindfulness to the rituals that you have uh, I guess the industry has done quite a phenomenal job in teaching us over the years that we need this morning product, this evening product, and constant addition and accretion of, of products, some of which will work, some of which won't, half of which will go to the back of the bathroom shelf. And, and then the process, you know, restarts and, and continues this idea of constant addition. The approach that we've taken up by Sarah London is born from my very personal story of, of Sarah creating skincare blends to help my very sensitive skin. And for me, my skin was very much triggered by fragrance and essential oils that were in a lot of mainstream skincare products. So Sarah stripped those out and created skincare blends mainly from plant oils, no added water. So the integrity of those products are so rich that actually a small amount goes a really long way. And we've been really mindful in which products we bring to markets. We have a very curated collection of products. So it means you can have the same fantastic skincare experience in the morning and the evening using the same products. There's no need to keep adding more and more and more when the skincare that we bring delivers on such a high level. So it's one way of really enjoying your skincare without having to add more and more products to your routine and your bathroom shelf. And it's just, I think, overwhelming from an individual point of view to keep trying and adding new products into your routine. To just strip it back just creates that bit of space and that empowerment. When you find something that works, you want to stick with it. Um, and it just frees up your, your morning and your bathroom shelf. So I think just this idea of being really mindful and intentional about the products you use, how it makes you feel, um, that's a great way to stick with what's working for you because we can be so distracted, the magpies that we all are, we'll see an ad, we'll see an influencer using something and it might not work for us. So it's just really sticking true to your values. Um, and I think that's a great way to sort of keep you on the straight and narrow with, with your skincare and your sustainability. Thank you. Um, I, I read a piece of research that said that um, the average woman uses 14 beauty and personal care products every day. Um, and I know I, I don't, so therefore that means somebody else must use a little, you know, more than, more than 14. And um, I, I think, that maybe we've just lost sight of, of some common, common sense. 
there's a, a great question that's just come in from Grace. I was going to hand over to you, Joe. So, um, you, you know, please, please add to that. But um, what uh, what thoughts um, do do you have about the changes from the brands that you stock that would make the biggest impact, single biggest impact today? And I, I know obviously you've taken a, a, a big step forward with sheet masks, like you did with wipes um, a year ago. But but what what's what's the next thing on your horizon? Yeah. Um, so, so just before we do that, you. you... I do have a sample of a soap on a rope on my desk at the moment. But anyone who's kind of my age or a bit older will, will know that soap on a rope was a thing in the 80s. And it just, just made me just made me chuckle. But actually, we've come, come full circle and we're now getting soap on a rope proposed. It's like a great, great product. And um, I think if I was just going to reflect a bit on, on really the only way to, to support customers to change is, is, is to make it easy. So we've tried lots of different things. So um, we've got some brands whereby you can send the packaging back and the packaging gets reused. But in reality, very few people send the packaging back, is the honest truth. Um, like minute numbers of people. Um, we've also um, we've also also got um, a, whole, a, whole, a whole load of different options um, around refills. So in, in one of our in one of our trial stores, you know, you can bring in your own container and you can you can refill it with shampoo or, or um, shower gel. But, but again, in reality, there's not that many people who are passionate enough to come, come into town with their empty bottles and actually use a refill station. So I think the, the, the key to making mass change is making it really easy. Um, and having tried lots of different swaps, swaps myself, I think the easy ones are, as you said, soap rather than shower gel, shampoo bar rather than shampoo, flannel rather than you know wipes um, and 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 I think as well as you said Jane it's, it's about about sim simplifying your, re your routine do you really need kind of a 10 stage beauty re routine um, and it's just helping people understand what the easy swaps are because because ultimately you know people are very busy they've got busy lives this is one of many things that they that they that they have to worry about and and, and if we don't make it easy and if we don't make it clear we won't we won't deliver the scale of change we need in the time that we need to. Mm. Will, Will King in the chat. Um, so keep going, Will. You're putting some amazing things in the chat. Um, you, you, you've been talking about um, lip balms and how in terms of recycling, very small units of plastic don't actually get recycled. Uh, and that's so true of a lot of our beauty products. I'm thinking particularly about color cosmetics. So I'm really happy now that Zoom, I don't know if you've seen it, but Zoom have got this special virtual effect where you can apply lots of virtual makeup. So um, maybe, maybe next time we do that, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll have a go at, at that. That's really, really exciting. And the other thing that I, I saw this week in the news, I don't know if you guys have seen it, but we have a, a Miss Great Britain, so a Miss Great Britain uh, for 27 to 35 year olds. And the winner of Miss Great Britain uh, refused to wear any makeup. Um, so again, I, I, I just find this very, very interesting what's happening now. Um, it, you know, and obviously that has a really big impact on sustainability. So I'm aware we're coming towards the end of our time together. And I have a final question for all of you. So Scott, are you outraged or are you optimistic? <laughs> um, both. I don't want to be a cop out. You know, it, it is it is outrage in the way of, I guess, you know, the volume of brands that are not coming to the table, you know, in the way of distractions, um, you know, without specific names, you know, you can only look at the some of the, you know, what I would see is some of the more respected beauty editors sort of reposting and fashion editors reposting content that they just, you know, and it's all about how that box will arrive and that whole experience um, or from a fashion perspective, you know, these big shows in Venice and, you know, I just find that outrageous and extraordinary in the truest sense of the word that, you know, they're not really listening. Um, and then there is the, the the other side where it is incredibly exciting. There is, um, I've, in all honesty, you know, an agony art moment, but I was having sort of career fatigue. I think probably a bit of career depression 
in, you know, just feeling a little bit like this sort of excess and volume, you know, um, that, that we, I felt we were contributing to in some ways, you know, sometimes from a shoot, you're creating like 150 to 200 assets from one day's shoot that pepper out on all global channels. Um, and, and it's all about buy more, you know. Um, and I never felt since we started this activist journey, and that's why I'm sort of encouraging everyone to find their own activist journey, um, how rewarding and how exciting and how quickly you find your people that share your values and how much of a momentum that gets so that actually the kind of job then, the, the sense of purpose is so much more meaningful. Um, and I think it's about that, isn't it? It's about us all being a part of the solution Every single one of us, you know, are two words are start and strengthen. You know, it's 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 scary because it just feels like this sort of narrative that we can't be a part of, but absolutely we can. Like Joanne was saying, in your small, you know, ways that we are changing our habitual kind of routines or you know how we're living, you know, they make en masse all the difference. So I'm feeling both. I feel the anguish and 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 the the kind of alarm in regards to the speed but I absolutely know that there is a huge amount to be hopeful with and that we are um, starting to have really progressive conversations um, and the other thing as well I, I kind of want to sort of finish with what I was saying about this sense of bringing in the children you know uh, I have these extraordinary chats with my son, you know, and he's nine and he talks about it with real clarity. Like, I think we should have more children in the boardroom. Um, and, and I guess the other thing is walk in nature with your shoes and socks off as much as you possibly can. It brings you back down to earth in more than one way. Oh, excellent advice. Lauren, outraged or optimistic? Absolutely optimistic. I think through my personal journey of seeing how plant oils have transformed my skin, seeing a category five hurricane firsthand and just thinking, my goodness, you know, this planet is one that we really need to protect. With the skincare that we've created, seeing how our followers and customers respond to it, it gives me so much hope that people are looking for really beautiful plant-based skincare, skincare that is transparent, skincare that they can trust. And it just gives me hope for the future that skincare will be so much more bountiful and sustainable in a way that it hasn't been previously. And it's happening quickly. Uh, and we're seeing this in real time. So I'm absolutely optimistic for the future. And you, Joe, where do you stand? Are you outraged or are you optimistic? I think I think I think like it's got a bit of both. Um, so in um, in my commute to, to work, I drive through some beautiful green belt land, which is currently being built on. And every time I drive through, I'm like, look at the biodiversity you're losing and don't even get me started about HS2. Um, you know, chopping, chopping down ancient woodland, like what are we doing? Like who needs to get to London five minutes faster? Um, but I think the thing which, which is making me feel, feel optimistic is as part of the sustainability council what i can see for the first time is lots of different retailers and lots of different brands and people really really stepping up and standing up and saying you know what this isn't something we can sort on our own but together if we all work together this you know we've, we've got much more of a hope of really turning things things around and making a big difference so i really hope that, that you know with the work that minnie's doing and she's doing a fantastic job really ra raising our profile uh, as an industry with the government um, that we can we can work together to make a difference. Ab absolutely, absolutely. And yourself, Jane? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm 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 both. Um, I think before um, the British Beauty Council initiated the work for the Sustainable Beauty Coalition, which came out of the Courage to Change report. So the report was commissioned. It was industry wide. We all contributed to it. Um, some, you know, some, some many names, big and small. I think I, I was very pessimistic and quite outraged now and we've it's the start of the journey you know we're what four months in i am hugely optimistic because i'm seeing so much of really excellent work that's happening 
um, and and it it's almost like lots of seeds are being planted and scattered and they're taking root and if we can just coordinate that because there are there are many 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 initiatives you know, we've talked about plastic packaging there are so many initiatives plastic packaging if we can coordinate that if we can we as an industry can have one unique voice into the government and joe you're absolutely right in terms of millie millie and the team have been amazing in terms of really putting our voice of the beauty industry in the room an industry that's been completely forgotten um possibly through gender who knows but covid has reconnected us with the importance of beauty and now we need to have a very loud voice in the room so i am incredibly optimistic now um but as I say, if you'd asked me six months ago, um, I, I, I was very different. I think the time is now, and I think we need to uh, stop pussyfooting around and just say it as it is, um, and understand that just doing something is better than doing nothing and not being a talking shop. And I think you know activism has got to be at the heart of what we do. And Scott, you mentioned the word courage. Courage comes from the heart. And we need to engage our heads and our hearts on this journey. So yeah. thank you ever so much. What a what a stirring conversation for a, a late Sunday afternoon, early I, evening. I just said this lovely thing that uh, my husband was sending me that Christian Scott Thomas, who's got this sort of crippling kind of you know stage fright issue, uh, when they was asked about that kind of going on and sort of you know nailing it, she says, "I'm afraid, but I'm also very very brave." And I just think that, that, you know, when we're talking about that, like, it, it, you know, look into the future, it is scary, but also we are amazing. Look at us. Look, we're human beings. We've done incredible things. So that sense of bravery as well. I'm just feeling, um, yeah, that courage and the bravery. Gosh. Absolutely. Uh, so for those of you that have joined us that haven't read the Courage to Change report, there's a link in the chat. Please do. Please join the movement. Um, please put your voice in the room. Thank you ever so much for joining us. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.